So talking to you all for the next 50 minutes or so on um, emergency protocols and triage in the shelter. Um, realize I don't work in the shelter, so I'm not really sure on, and I, my understanding, like veterinary hospitals, is everybody has different levels of resources. Um, I know that some of the shelters and rescues I work with um, definitely are very much on a shoestring budget. But I also have some that surprisingly have very deep pockets. Um, so I think it's quite variable. So my tack on this is to talk primarily about triage and some of the really life-threatening things that we might run into to better um, help you kind of intervene on patients that may be critically ill earlier and faster and hopefully save more lives. And then hopefully you can adapt that information to what will work in your practice, in your shelter or rescue organization, uh, given the resources that you may have available to you. Uh, so that was kind of my approach to this, this topic today. As far as with um, what the kinds of things I'm talking to, I try not to go crazy with really fancy stuff. But ba most of the things I'm talking about kind of I'll be mentioning things that probably for an in-house laboratory, the things we rely on really strongly are things like being able to do quick assessment tests like packed cell volume, total solids, blood glucose, azoestimate. Um, electrolytes, I think, are pretty important because uh, we can have life-threatening problems with electrolyte derangements. I do like lactate. You can live without it, but boy, it comes in handy, um, especially uh, for shocky patients. Um, being able to measure a creatinine uh, sometimes helps us as well for severity of kidney disease, um, severity of illness, and helping people make decisions uh, where to invest their resources, so to speak. Uh, urine dipstick, again, nice and cheap. Some coagulation assay, and a lot of people tell me, well, we can't do a prothrombin time or an activated thromboplastin time. The machines are too expensive. They are coming down in price all the time, and they are avail available on the secondary market. I've bought equipment off eBay. It's amazing what you can find. Um, but at the very minimum, you should be able to run at least an activated clotting time. It's a tube with dirt in it, okay? Activated clotting time is the gray top stopper tube. You don't have to have the heating block. You can run it using your armpit, so it's a cheap, efficient test. It's not near as sensitive as the prothrombin time or the activated thromboplastin time, but it's very useful, especially like for anticoagulant rodenticide ingestion in patients with really severe coagulopathy. So it is something that I think anybody could potentially have in their practice. I do think it's pretty essential if you're going to be doing veterinary medicine to have a microscope available um, and obviously a refractometer. And then other types of equipment that we utilize obviously are anesthesia machines, oxygen uh, therapy, um, like to have an EKG, pulse oximeter, blood pressure monitors, and tidal CO2 is quite useful and probably not as commonly used out in practice, at least that's my uh, perception from talking to people. And then obviously you need a centrifuge to be able to spin down some of these samples. Um, and then x-rays are obviously kind of nice too. Um, but that's kind of the general kind of what I'm working with in this lecture of types of things I'll be utilizing. So first off, triage, where does the term come from? Trier to sort, um, which is a French word. I know there's at least one French in the audience. I have no idea if I said that correctly. I have a bad accent. Um, but uh, it's basically an organized approach to multiple patients, uh, ensuring that the most critically ill are identified and stabilized first. And I guess in addition to that is patients that perhaps are not as salvageable, maybe helps us make decisions on which one, where to really focus our energies. This is not unlike um, sorting of M&Ms to determine which ones are, um, which colors are most flavorful and should be eaten first. And I know most of you have probably done that. Anybody else an M&M sorter in the audience? <laughs> Think of triage when you sort your M&Ms. It's really the same principle. All right, so triage, uh, we're gonna prioritize our patients based on the severity of injury, and that's when we're thinking about triage and the concept of multiple patients presenting at one time, which all of us have to deal with. But also it helps me in an individual patient when I think about triaging their body systems to identify the life-threatening injuries and help me target uh, what injury or what abnormality I need to focus on first to try and preserve that patient's life. So you can apply the concept of triage in many ways to your patients. So who should be performing a triage? Uh, well, you do need to have somebody who's trained in triage. Um, in our hospital, that's usually a, a licensed or certified veterinary technician or one of the veterinarians or one of the students that's um, being trained to be a veterinarian. Um, it does require some training uh, to be able to perform an adequate triage. When should a triage happen uh, after a patient presents to the hospital? How much time should elapse before somebody's looking at that patient to determine whether it's stable or non-stable? Really, it should be one to two minutes of presentation. 
And you know, lots of times, you know, the students are like, oh, let me just finish this discharge. They're busy typing away in the computer. I'm like, no. And they say, well, the front desk didn't say stat. And I say, the front desk isn't trained on what's stable and what's not stable. And sometimes a stat simply means that the owner's hysterical and the patient's actually fine. Um, and that's when we get a stat from the front desk. So it really does require some training to go up and perform uh, an appropriate triage on, the, on our patients. So um, why, again, we want to determine if a patient requires immediate intervention. And right off the bat, based on the client's chief complaint, what they're telling me is wrong with the pet, there are some conditions that regardless of what the pet looks like, it's going to warrant an immediate triage to the back. Anybody have any ideas of some of the chief complaints that might warrant an immediate triage to the back? Respiratory problems, absolutely. Respiratory distress, that absolutely gets my attention very rapidly. What else? Seizures, GDV, what else? Even if they're not actively seizuring, right? If they're coming in because they've been seizuring, but they're not actively seizuring right now, the last thing I want to have happen is that dog to seizure up in the waiting room. I have literally witnessed a dog seizure in a waiting room where the other dogs in the waiting room perceived that as an abnormal animal and the pack mentality kicked in and they all jumped at the seizuring dog to attack it. So that's bad. We don't want that happening in our waiting room. And then what happens when the animal seizure? They pee and they poop. Who wants to clean that up in the waiting room? And our clients don't like it. So patients presenting for seizure activity immediately are going to come to the back, even if they're not actively seizuring. What else? Is some a reason to come directly to the back? Animal who's non-ambulatory, laterally recumbent, can't walk. Or even if they collapsed earlier in the day, but they look perfectly fine now, that animal's coming straight to the back. Because again, I don't want them collapsing up front. Collapse might mean their heart kind of stopped earlier today. And I don't want that happening in the waiting room because I don't know that it's going to start back up on its own again. What else did I hear over here? I just can't hear. I'm going deaf. Block cats. Block cats. Yeah, inability to urinate, whether you're a cat or a dog. If you're straining to urinate, now what I might do on the triage is palpate the abdomen and see if the bladder is big or small, right? If it's really small and the animal otherwise looks OK, it might be OK to sit up there, depending on caseload. But if the bladder's big and they're straining to urinate, or if they look sick, there's something else triggering a triage to the back, they're going to come back. Well, anybody got anything else? I've got a few more things on my list. So obviously, an animal who's unresponsive, and it may be that they're still alive, but they may actually be in cardiac arrest. So that probably warrants either coming straight to the back or having a conversation. Anything particular respiratory absolutely gets my attention. A loss of consciousness. Um, we talked about, oh, anything that's had any significant trauma, fell from the deck, got hit by a car, had an altercation with a wild animal. That's a reason, even if they look OK, to come straight to the back. Um, lots of animals can look OK because of the adrenaline rush of going bye-bye in the car or whatever happened. And then once that adrenaline wears off, you actually realize they have an internal bleed or something very serious happening, and they're actually shocky or having a problem. So any significant trauma is an automatic come to the back. Anything that's actively bleeding or has an open wound in our hospital comes straight to the back. Number one, I don't want blood all over the waiting room. I don't want the dog's happy tail to flick on the 50 clients sitting in the waiting room, and then I have to pay all their dry cleaning bills. Um, and I want to get it covered because I don't know about you, but we grow some pretty nasty organisms in our hospital because we have sick patients on lots of antibiotics. So I want to cover those wounds to optimize healing to keep the tissue moist and to optimize any repair that might happen, but also to try and prevent any of my bad organisms getting into that wound and causing a bad infection. Anything that has ingested something or has an intoxication, I'm going to get to the back, even if they're very stable, because maybe there's an antidote or something, or I need to start decontamination procedures for that patient. So any intoxication is going to come straight to the back. Um, abdominal distension, and then obviously, I don't want my parvo puppy sitting up in the front either with all the other unvaccinated dogs that may be up there. So infectious disease suspects will come to the back. But y'all hit the big ones. All right, so um, how do we actually do the triage? So all of us were taught ABCs, right? What does ABC stand for? Airway breathing circulation. You're always taught go up and do the ABCs. Well, I'll be perfectly honest. On triage for me, the ABCs are really, is he dead or alive? <laughs> I simplify things. So if the patient's looking at me, I'm going to do more of a triage. If he's unresponsive, I'm going to look as I'm approaching the client, is the patient breathing? If he's not breathing, is the heart beating? So literally for me, ABC is, is he dead or alive? Let's just simplify it. 
Because if he's alive, and I don't, based on that, have an indication to run the patient to the back, or it's not one of the automatic things that's going to go straight to the back based on the chief complaint, then I'm going to proceed with what we refer to as a primary survey. And the primary survey is really the meat of what we're going to talk about as far as triage. And that's where we get a little bit of information from the client, so a brief history. And then we're going to do a very brief physical assessment. This is not a complete physical exam. This is a brief, brief assessment to assess stability. And I'm primarily going to be focused on mentation, <coughs> cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and perfusion, which is obviously tied closely to cardiovascular. But the reason we focus on those is because those are the body systems that if something's very wrong, those are the things that are going to kill you quickly. So those are the most serious body systems. So the triage history, I want to know the chief complaint. Why are you here today? And this is the hardest part of triage. Because the client, when I say, why are you here today? And they say, well, five years ago, I have just tuned out and I'm internally groaning. Because I really don't know, want to know what happened five years ago on triage. I might want to know that when I'm getting the full history, but not on triage. On triage, I want to know what prompted you to come in today. What has gotten worse or what has started? What has been the general progression of that? Is he on any treatments and have you seen any response? And if there's any major health conditions I need to know about, like maybe he's diabetic, that's probably something to know on triage. All right? But really, this is a very minimal, basically focusing on chief complaint, and progression, why are you, what prompted you to bring him in on emergency today? And then I'm going to go through and I honestly start doing my triage assessment before I even talk to the client because I usually can eyeball who I'm here to see as I enter the waiting room and I'm already eyeballing the pet. And what should a dog, well what should a dog look like on triage in the waiting room? He should be like either sitting at his owner's leg, shaking, looking at everybody else around him, very alert or lunging at everybody, either to bite or to bark, and say hi. So they should be very aware of their surroundings. They should be watching everything and really interactive. And if they're kind of a limp rag, that's already got my attention, all right? So I'm already starting the assessment before I've even introduced myself to the client, once I've pegged my man. So I want to know what the patient's level of consciousness is. And we typically describe patients as either being alert, and you can be quite sick but still alert, right? You've had patients that are laying there that are pretty sick, but their eyes are watching everything that's happening in the room. They're alert. Or you can have a patient who's technically obtunded. So they're not quite upstairs, right? They're a little bit off. Um, and, um, but they still respond. You know, if you scratch their ear in a nice way, they still kind of respond to it. But they're not quite right upstairs. That, for me, is obtunded. And then they can progress if they don't respond to that ear scratch. But then when you go to pinch their toe or you go to put that catheter in, They've been pretty unresponsive, right, until you prick the skin with the catheter and all of a sudden the head comes up. That's probably stuporous. So they're not responsive to a positive stimulus, but they do respond to a noxious stimulus. And then we have patients who respond to no stimulus and they're defined as comatose. So we try and identify patients or describe patients' their mentation as either being alert, obtunded, stuporous, or comatose. And many of us, myself included, kind of throw something between alert and obtunded, and that might be quiet or a little bit dull, because they're not quite meeting the category of obtunded, but they're not quite alert. So I admit, sometimes we throw that in there. All right, and then I have to kind of decide relatively quickly, do I think that's a primary problem? In other words, do I think there's a problem with the brain? Or do I think it's related to the fact that he feels really crappy, maybe he's a little shocky, and he's just a little mentally dull because of it. it's secondary to whatever else is going on? All right. After I have assessed mentation, I'm going to move on to one of the other three. I'm starting here with respiratory. So I'm going to assess the respiratory system. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking at the way they're breathing and how fast they're breathing. So I know a respiratory rate, and I want to observe the effort that they're putting into it. I'm also going to pull out my stethoscope. So when you go to triage, you should have your stethoscope on. I'm going to sculpt the lungs. And I want to know, am I hearing just normal bronchovesicular sounds? Or am I hearing abnormal adventitial sounds like crackles or whistles or wheezes? Um, and I want to correlate that as well to how heavy the animal's breathing. If they're breathing really hard and I hear very quiet lung sounds, that's not appropriate for the amount of effort. They should be moving large volumes and I should be hearing good full lung sounds, right? So you're always, and if they're breathing really short and shallow, just real quiet, sometimes it's hard to hear those lung sounds. So you want to correlate it with the effort that they're putting in as well. <clears throat> 
This is an example of a dog who's in overt respiratory distress. And my distinction between tachypnea or rapid breathing, well, first off, tachypnea is rapid breathing. And then we have patients who are tachypnic with abdominal effort, right? But not all patients that are tachypnic and have increased effort are actually in overt respiratory distress. So there's a difference. We've all seen the patient that's tachypnic with increased abdominal effort, but they're relatively comfortable. They're not in overt distress. So what prompts me as a clinician to write tachypnic with increased effort on one patient, and what's different about that patient and prompts me to write respiratory distress on the second one? And it's a physical exam finding or an observation finding. And when you see orthopnic posturing, that's the line, that's the difference. Does anybody remember what the orthopnic postures are? Elbows abducted. And there's a physiologic payoff for every one of those orthopnic postures. Elbows abducted, I can take a bigger, freer breath. I can get a bigger tidal volume. I heard head and neck extended. What's my physiologic payoff by extending my head and neck? I've straightened the upper airway, reducing upper airway resistance, making easier to move that air. And it's the same physiologic reason why open mouth breathing um, is also an orthopnic posture. It reduces upper airway resistance. What do you do when you go for a run? Do you still breathe through your nose? Some of you might. I bet a bunch you breathe through your mouth because it's decreased airway resistance. You can move larger volumes of air more easily. So there's always a physiologic payoff, but those are your orthopnic postures. The other thing we observe is patients in respiratory distress almost always will stay sternal or standing. An animal in overt respiratory distress, in my experience, so this is just opinion, that goes over into lateral recumbency is about to arrest. Almost always. They are giving up. Most of these animals will fight to stay upright, sternal. And there's a physiologic payoff for that. Remember, for oxygen to get into the blood, from the lungs into the blood, you've got alveoli being ventilated, and you have them being perfused. And we optimize that ratio of ventilation to perfusion if we stay upright versus having atelectasis if we lay over in lateral. All right? So they're trying, fighting to stay upright, and when they go lateral, 99 times out of 100, it means they're giving up and they're about to arrest. So if I have a patient in overt respiratory distress go lateral, somebody, maybe me, is going to go run up and get a hold of a client if we don't know what their wishes are with regard to coding. And then somebody else, if we are a go, we're going to think about emergently intubating that patient and taking over the airway because they're about to arrest. All right? So this video I'm going to play is an example of a dog demonstrating all the orthopnic postures um, in an oxygen cage. There's no sound on this one. Elbows, head and neck, staying sternal, open mouth breathing. He's in trouble. All right, cardiovascular system on triage. What do we do to assess the cardiovascular system? So we want to listen to the heart sounds. And first off, if they're absent, that is a definition of dead. Well, I guess if he's unresponsive and they're absent, right? I guess if he's moving around and they're absent, you're probably just not hearing them for some reason. So I guess if he's completely unresponsive and you can't hear heart, it's probably dead. Um, but I do want to listen, and are they loud and distinct? Are they muffled and distant? Are they asymmetrical? I would argue that dogs, if they're standing upright, I can usually hear the apical beat a little bit louder on the left than on the right. If I can't hear it on the left and I'm hearing it really loud on the right, I'm like, huh, is something shifting the heart over to that side? Could there be something going on? Cats, I feel like I hear it best kind of around the sternum. Not always left or right. Again, I mentioned in the other room earlier, cats are full of trickery, so they're harder to assess sometimes. But I'm listening for lots of things with the heart sounds, not just the lub-dub, but I'm listening for all these other things as well. I also want to know, is the rhythm regular or irregular? All right. And if it's irregular, I want to correlate it with my breathing. Is it, in other words, like a respiratory sinus arrhythmia, where the rate is increased with inspiration and decreased with expiration, the animal otherwise looks stable. And in a dog, that would be considered potentially normal. But in a cat, it's not. Any other irregularity to the rhythm is probably representative of a significant arrhythmia. Bingo, right now I have a reason to go to the back. Take that animal to the back. All right. So I know is the rhythm regular or irregular. And I also want to have some period of time while I'm asculting that I'm also feeling a pulse at the same time. For every beat that I hear, can I feel a corresponding pulse? If I have pulse deficits or I don't have a pulse for every heartbeat, what do I have? I have an arrhythmia. And that warrants going straight to the back. I'm dropping beats. There's something about that contraction that was different. It's most likely arrhythmic. 
And then I want to know is the rate too fast or too slow? So what's too fast a heart rate for a dog and what's too slow a heart rate for a dog? And more often than not, it's going to be on the fast side, right? We don't see a ton of bradycardic emergencies, although we see them. More often than not, it's tachycardic emergencies. What's too fast for a chihuahua and what's too fast for a Labrador retriever? Chihuahua. Somebody toss it out there. Too fast. 180, 200. Uh, Labrador Retriever. 140. Great Dane. Too fast. So the reason I do this is because a paper came out within the last few years which agreed with my feeling. So of course I'm going to show it to you, right? I don't show you the ones that disagree with my thought process. Um, and it came out and showed that heart rate doesn't actually vary that much on presentation to the hospital in dogs based on their size. It's about a 10 to 12 beat per difference rate. What I think is far more important when I'm looking at rate, and I look at rate on these patients all the time, is what's the right conjunction with how the animal is acting. I would argue that probably anything over 140 is too fast regardless of the breed, most likely unless it's absolutely doing backflips, you know, like totally psycho in the room. If it's a chihuahua and it's 140 and it comes up and it wags its tail and it interacts with you but then lays down on the table, 140 is too fast for that chihuahua. If it's 140 and he's lunging at you, either trying to kiss you or trying to rip your face off, depending on where you are with chihuahuas, then 140 might be appropriate, okay? So it's far more important, I would argue, the same, almost the same numbers for the Labrador, pretty much identical numbers for the Labrador, and maybe just very slight differences for the Great Dane or the giant breed dog. So it's much more important to look at heart rate in conjunction with the attitude of the animal than it is just an absolute number. So um, those are the things I assess with uh, specific to cardiovascular, although perfusion is obviously very tightly related to cardiovascular, but it's so important to assess perfusion on triage that we treat it separately. So with perfusion, we're also going to look at the mucous membranes. Um, I want to look at the color of the mucous membranes as well as the capillary refill time. I want to know the pulse quality on the patient, how strong are the pulses. I want to look at the temperature as well. And we're going to talk about each of these things a little bit more. So mucous membrane color, um, if they're dark red or injected, um, unless you're a white boxer type or pity type, sometimes they can look a little injected just with excitement. Or, and most dogs can look this way with being overheated. I have hyperthermia or fever on here. Um, but certainly we worry with injected membranes about things like sepsis or systemic inflammation um, or really hyperdynamic shock. So that absolutely gets my attention. And I would triage enamel to the back with injected mucous membranes, unless, again, it's one of these breeds that sometimes can look that way and they otherwise look fine. They should just be pink. Pink is normal. And then really pale mucous membranes may be indicative of anemia. Or it may be that there's just a perfusion problem. I've had animals that were so white I could not detect a CRT who had completely normal hematocrits. They were just perfusing that badly. So um, pale mucous membranes can be either or or a combination of both. Um, or realize if an animal is really painful, sometimes they'll be really pale as well, just from the surge of catecholamines from being painful. Um, white mucous membranes, if they're totally white, more often than not, there's a, both an anemic and a, uh, or anemic component to it, I will admit. And then cyanotic mucous membranes or blue mucous membranes, blue-gray, that is bad. Blue-gray is very bad. And um, it's not a very sensitive marker for respiratory difficulty. So in other words, you can have patients who are dying from their respiratory distress who don't have cyanosis, all right, especially if they're anemic. And it has to do with the amount of hemoglobin in the blood and what the eye can see. But if you do see cyanosis, that's automatically bad, and that would definitely get my attention. And then obviously icteric mucous membranes, the big things we think about, are could he be hemolyzing red blood cells? Are they anemic? That's one of the first things we'll test for. Could they have either liver or biliary disease? Um, and then sepsis can cause icterus through all of those mechanisms. So it's always something I'm thinking about as an emergency doctor when I have an icteric patient. Could that patient actually be a septic patient? Because I don't want to miss sepsis. I'm also going to evaluate capillary refill time. And here's an example of really hyperdynamic. This is really fast. That is way too fast CRT. It's immediately refilling, all right? So that's hyperdynamic. That would definitely get my attention. Normal should be one to two seconds for that. When you blanch it, put enough pressure on the lip or the gums to blanch it, it should take no more than one to two seconds and no less than one for that to refill. And then I have an example of two slower CRT as well. This takes about three, two and a half to three seconds to completely refill. You can see how slow that is. 
to refill after it's been blanched. So that would be a poor perfusion, an indicator of poor perfusion. Pulse quality, we kind of talk about pulse with synchronicity with heart rate and whatnot, but we're also going to feel for quality of the pulse. There's a lot of information you can actually glean from that. We can have very weak, thready pulses, so the quality of the pulse itself, again, if it's irregular or absent. I'm worried about cardiovascular collapse, um, something shock, a heart problem, something along that line, and arrhythmia if it's irregular. If they're bounding or strong, there are things that can do that as well. Animals with fevers, um, are high temperatures from hyperthermia that are septic or have hyperdynamic shock very commonly have very strong pulse quality. Anemic pulses also can be perceived as strong. They're kind of a shorter, sharper, kind of staccato style pulse. Uh, normally I think of a pulse, if you think of pulse having a sound, it would be like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Anemic animals will be like toot, 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 because it's much less viscous, so you don't have that viscous blood creating a longer, smoother pulse. It's much more like water, and so you get a sharper pulse quality, which can be somewhat stronger. And then there are certain heart problems that can cause bounding pulses as well, some heart abnormalities like patent ductus arteriosus, which is the classically described as the water hammer pulses, and aortic insufficiency can cause quite a bounding pulse as well. But we don't see those as commonly, so usually we're worried about these other pathologic problems. And then obviously temperature abnormalities. Now I will admit we don't, we don't tend to take temperatures on our triage and I think that's fine. Um, the main reason is sometimes it takes two people and we're generally sending one person up to do a triage and sometimes you don't want somebody to get bitten or, you know, or even worse maybe, right? You put the thermometer in what sometimes is that trigger bit of bowel movement so now you've got the dog pooping up in the waiting room. That's never fun. So we don't always take a temperature. Um, but um, if you make it your policy too, because some places do, um, obviously an elevated temperature could either be a true fever where the body is saying, I want the temperature to be higher because of a cytokine response, inflammation um, affecting the brain and resetting that um, set point. Or it could be hyperthermia, and I always think of hyperthermia as usually due to the ease, excitement, exercise, right, hyperactive or environment, really hot day, or a combination of both. So having been left in the hot car, it's a really hot day, or just went for a run, your temperature's gonna be up by a couple of degrees, and that's typically hyperthermia. Or you've been seizuring or tremoring, right, and now your temperature's 110, that's technically hyperthermia, not fever, because it's due to all the muscle activity, all right? A low temperature, we always worry about perfusion problems, or obviously we think about if they're under anesthesia, et cetera, which actually wouldn't be on a triage. Um, or environment, if it's really cold outside or they've been outside, they could come in with a true hypothermia problem. What we do more on our triage, actually, is I run my hands over the patient. Um, do they feel appropriately warm or are they cool to the touch? How do they feel over their trunk? And then I feel the ears and I feel the distal extremities. I have a dog in the ICU right now who's septic um, and she's not following the classic like septic stuff. But she's got really, she's got a high temperature of 104, but her ears are ice cold and her feet are ice cold uh, because she's got really vaso, she's strongly vasoconstricted. So having a discrepancy between kind of the temperature over the core of the body and the extremities tells me they may be having a perfusion problem. So that always gets my attention. So use your hands. And then as I mentioned before, wounds, we try um, active bleeding. We want to apply direct pressure and we want to cover and protect wounds so they come straight back. So now we have an animal we've moved to the back. We have to spend some time talking about what we're going to do with them, right? And this is really hard to think about putting in a 50-minute lecture because there's so many different things we talked about bringing an animal to the back for. Intoxication, can't pee, et cetera. How am I supposed to cover all of that, right? So I pick kind of the big things and maybe the things um, that need to be addressed quicker to try and address in this, in this forum today. So um, many of these patients, especially if we've picked up perfusion deficits or we're worried um, that they may have a cardiac problem or a life-threatening problem, we're probably going to establish venous access. The exception to that might be a patient with severe respiratory distress because it might be that trying to get a catheter in will actually be too stressful for them and push them over the edge. But many patients that we triage to the back, we're going to establish venous access. And when we do that, most, and we are usually going for cephalic catheters, most of the time we can get a little bit of blood. It'll bleed back when you first place it. And I can run a minimum database off of that. So that's usually what we prioritize. So I meant to mention something about cats. So before we go further into resuscitation, I want to mention how do I triage a cat? Well, hopefully most of my cats come to me in, in contained of, in some way, like a carrier. I've had a few clients walk into the hospital with their cat just walking behind them, not on a leash, not on nothing, 
freaks me out every time. It's only happened a few times, but I'm like, uh, no. But most of the time they come in in a carrier, and I really do not like opening carriers in the waiting room. Freaked out, scared cat. Most cats don't like going bye-bye in the car. And last thing I want is the cat to dart the carrier, be out the front door, and be gone. And I don't know of a single hospital that that hasn't happened to at least a handful of times if you've been in practice very long. And all of us feel horrible when it happens. So my policy with a cat is if I'm going to triage it, I take it to a smaller space that I can close, whether that's an examination room or back to my treatment area, whatever works for you. I open the carrier, I evaluate, I do my triage assessment. If the cat is stable enough to sit up with the owner, it goes back in the carrier, goes up with the owner until we, it's turn to be seen on the emergency service. If it's deemed unstable or it needs to stay in the back, then we go up and inform the client that we'd like to keep her back there and why. All right. So cats I do handle, handle a little bit differently than the average dog. So with resuscitation, as I said, animals coming to the back, we're oftentimes going to place a catheter, usually a cephalic most of the time, and collect and evaluate a minimum database. And we might consider at this point, because again, those catheters will frequently bleed back, we can sometimes get additional samples, even if we're not going to run them right away. Sometimes, how many of you have ever had the vet say, oh, well, do we have blood from before we gave the fluids? Happens all the time in my practice. So we try and collect those samples. Even if we don't use them, we have them if for some reason we want to go back and, and have a look at something. The goal of resuscitation in addition is going to be to normalize the, the physiologic functions we detected were abnormal. And it's going to require frequent reassessment. So these patients, if they're coming in on emergency and they're sick and you're triaging them to the back, they are patients that probably warrant reevaluation frequently. And with that reevaluation, we'll be able to monitor trends. So venous access. Um, the things I think about before I put a catheter in, ooh, I did something different, um, is, is the patient going to be in a need of a large volume of fluids, like boluses, which is more often than not what I'm dealing with. So I'm going to think short catheter, larger gauge versus a long sampling line type thing. Is the patient likely to have diarrhea? If it's a parvo puppy, I don't really want to put a catheter in the back leg because it's probably going to be covered in diarrhea. He's probably going to be neutropenic, and then I'm going to end up with a septic parvo puppy. Um, from a catheter problem. So I take into consideration what's going on with the pet. Are they vomiting, having diarrhea? Is, there, is it a pyometra? Again, I'd probably avoid a back leg with some of those situations. Are there injuries to consider? If he's lame on his right front leg, I probably don't want to put the catheter in the right front leg, right? Or if there's a laceration that's going to have to be sewn up. Um, so I do try and take that into account as well. And then could the patient have a bleeding disorder? So if you're seeing petechia and ecchymosis or spontaneous bruising on this patient, especially, or if it might be a coagulopathic patient, whether it, because it ate anticoagulant rodenticide, you're suspicious it has a bleeding disorder, do not do jugular vena puncture or place a jugular catheter. It is much harder to apply pressure and hold off the jugular in a way that they don't continue to bleed. If I held off and then I thought it was clotted and my cephalic starts to blow up again because they have a bleeding problem, I'm going to see that pretty soon, probably, right? If it's the jugular, there's a lot of space that blood can travel through all those tissues, down towards the mediastinum, and you won't see a swelling. I know there's a problem, and I've actually had seen a patient, a cocker spaniel, that had immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, who had a single jugular vena puncture that went textbook fine, that bled to death, could not get the bleeding under control. So be very, I'd be very careful if you're worried you have a coagulopathy about touching the jugular veins. Um, and then, in general, as I said, larger gauge is better with catheters, and we consider short versus long, um, central versus peripheral, I'm guessing. And for me, most of the time, we're just placing peripheral catheters on these patients um, or intraosseous. Intraosseous is quite handy in very small patients, neonates, puppies, kittens, exotic species, et cetera. So we do use that a fair amount as well. We're going to collect our minimum database, and I would say at the very minimum, that's a quat really cheap. You've got a couple of the microhematocrit tubes, a titch of clay, and you've got to have a centrifuge. But otherwise, you get a lot of information with your quick assessment tests. So we do those pretty much in every patient. And then um, I do like getting a venous blood gas. On our venous blood gas, it also gives me electrolytes. And then I have acid base. Um, and then I can plus minus a lactate. So that's kind of our minimum database on most emergent patients that we see. Additionally, I'm going to go ahead, if I can get blood easily enough from the patient, I'm going to go ahead and draw my CBC, um, chemistry panel, urinalysis, and coag profile. And I'd strongly recommend that if you're pulling a CBC, go ahead and make a fresh smear at the time you draw the blood. If you wait and you send your blood to, and you decide you want the CBC hours later or you send the blood to the lab, 
and they go to make smears later, there's artifact caused by the EDTA on the blood that makes the staining different and it makes it much harder for them to interpret the CBC. So we actually get complaints from our lab when they're like, you didn't send us smears that were made fresh. We had to make the smears and now we can't interpret your CBC. So it's much better to go ahead and just make the smears when you draw the blood. Um, and then also, we look at smears on a lot of our emergency patients, probably 90% of them, we look at the smears. And you don't get good at looking at smears unless you do a lot of them, all right? And it's great to look at smears when you do send the CBC in, because then you can compare what your results were to what the lab gave you. And that's how you get really good. We do platelet estimates. Um, we look at, is there, does a patient look like it has an adequate number of neutrophils? Sometimes we pick up red blood cell parasites. Um, we picked up not too long ago um, the highest burden of Babesia that they'd ever seen in ClinPath when we sent the sample down there and we picked that up in the ER because uh, we saw them on the red blood cells, probably because it was the highest burden they'd ever seen, but we did see it. We're very proud of that. Um, you can see that there's a left shift. You can see if there's toxic change. It gives you a lot of information and it's dirt cheap. It's a slide and some time in a microscope. So get practice at doing blood smears. Um, and then obviously we try and get urine pretreatment, but I would never withhold therapy on a patient. Um, and then we have the ability to coags as needed as well. And then we're going to try and normalize pa uh, parameters. Um, and again, it's going to depend on why you triage them to the back. If you're worried they're at all shocky, respiratory distress, cardiovascular collapse, any of those types of things, oxygen is never wrong. Oxygen is really only wrong if you're on fire, right? That's the only time oxygen is really contraindicated. So I'm going to err on the side of giving oxygen most of the time. And then a lot of my patients are going to get IV fluids. Um, and my goal here is to normalize those physical exam findings that were maybe abnormal, so temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate and effort, mucous membrane color, capillary refill time, pulse quality, blood pressure. So blood pressure is the only thing on this list that's somewhat objective. The rest of those are very subjective. But you do have to be going and reevaluating things, right? Or you're not going to know how your patient's doing. And I would strongly suggest to use things in addition to blood pressure, other more objective parameters like lactate and base deficit. They're very useful. And there's a lot of data in the human literature and there's growing data in the veterinary literature with respect to really critically ill patients and especially GDVs that serial lactate monitoring and base deficit monitoring can be quite useful and may be um, somewhat prognostic. So it is quite useful to look at. Heart rate and rhythm, again, arrhythmia or pulse deficits, we're automatically just going to get an EKG on that patient. We need to know what the rhythm disturbance is. And the most common things we see are going to be sinus tachycardia, so just a fast, regular rate. We may see ventricular rhythm, supraventricular tachycardia, AFib or bradycardia. And I've got each of these. So this is a classic sinus tach, okay? All right. Um, and it's basically got a P, Q, or S, T for every, and the, the complexes all look pretty uniform, uh, pretty regular. And that could just be due to being really happy or terrified of that car ride that they just experienced. They may be in pain, could cause a sinus tachycardia very easily as well. Or maybe if they exerted themselves, they, you just wrestled with them to get the muzzle on. I would probably expect a sinus tachycardia on that patient. But there's lots of pathologic reasons for a sinus tachycardia as well. Maybe the patient's really anemic. Maybe they have a fever, so they've upped everything. They're shocky. They're, their heart's beating faster, trying to meet the body's needs with oxygen delivery. Hyperthyroidism, classically known to have sinus tachycardia as well. Or maybe, again, the heart's trying, but it can't do the job, so it's beating faster and faster, but it's just a sinus tach. So lots of things that can cause a sinus tach. We also frequently see ventricular arrhythmias, and this EKG has ventricular beats. So it has some normal beats over here. It's got a PQRST. And then it has ventricular beats in there. And uh, ventricular arrhythmias most commonly actually aren't primary heart disease. Unless you're like a boxer or a Doberman, most of the time ventricular arrhythmias are due to systemic disease, something else affecting the heart. Um, so things like um, when the heart muscle, I, I like to very, in very um, scientific terms, tell the students, yeah, the heart muscle's pissed off. So the heart muscle hasn't been getting enough oxygen because you're anemic. The heart muscle hasn't been getting enough oxygen because you're shocky. The heart muscle um, got whacked when he got hit by a car and is now inflamed and irritated. Um, so all of those things can contribute to, contribute to ventricular arrhythmias. High levels of surge in catecholamines, epinephrine is highly arrhythmogenic and can cause ventricular arrhythmias. So if there's a reason that we have a catecholamine surge, pain, excitement. We know splenic disease, animals with splenic torsion, GDV, et cetera, tumors in the spleen very commonly have ventricular arrhythmias. So splenic disease. 
Um, sepsis, inflammation, fever, again, that heart muscle is not benign. It's part of the body and it can be affected by all the things that affect the body. And then additionally, acid-base disturbances, electrolyte disturbances can cause cardiac arrhythmia as well. There are primary cardiac problems that can cause ventricular arrhythmias, um, congestive heart failure, but probably more often than not it's due to poor oxygen delivery to the muscle itself, but cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, uh, inflammation of the heart muscle, et cetera. Supraventricular arrhythmia, in contrast to ventricular arrhythmia, is almost always due to primary heart disease. We can see intermittent premature supraventricular um, complexes, but when you have a sustained supraventricular tachycardia, uh, like what we're seeing at the first part of the CKG, and then it converts. Um, and you can see there's no P wave for each of those QRSs, but the QRSs are about 90% the same as the regular R wave. So the R wave here, this is an abnormal. There's no normal P wave here, but that R wave, when you compare it to the R wave in this normal complex, it has a normal P QRST, is very similar. So that's a supraventricular complex, and this is a very rapid, like 300 beat a bit per minute, supraventricular tachycardia that then kind of corrected. That's almost always due to primary heart disease, structural heart disease. So whether it's a bad valvular disease, dog, cardiomyopathy, um, et cetera, there's usually something primary to the heart. AFib is classically described as hearing the tennis shoes in the washing machine, right, or the dryer. That's kind of an irregular, irregular rhythm. Um, they'll oftentimes have pulse deficits. And what kinds of dogs do we see AFib, uh, AFib in the most? What types of breeds? So I worry about dogs that are predisposed to DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. So my giant breed dogs, Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, um, the really big dogs, and then Dalmatians and a few others. But AFib is uh, pretty tightly correlated with dilated cardiomyopathy. You can see it with chronic valvular disease when the um, atria get really big, but it's, it's mostly a cardiomyopathy thing in dogs. We very rarely see AFib in cats, it's quite rare. And then I mentioned we don't see a ton of bradycardia on emergency, but we can see sinus bradycardia or some of them, sinus bradycardia being one of them. If a patient's really cold, if it's the winter and they fell into the lake and the owner found them wet, cold, and their temperature is 92, I guarantee you they're going to have a sinus bradycardia just because you need to warm them up and the heart rate will speed up as you warm them up. Um, Acid-based and electrolyte disturbances, particular hyperkalemia, uh, is something we commonly see in our blocked animals to see a sinus bradycardia, and some other waveform um, changes can be present as well. Um, and then animals under anesthesia, they either they're too deep or they're getting cold or a combination, obviously we can see that as well. And then I mentioned in my other lecture, um, animals with intracranial disease or elevated intracranial pressure, like may have had traumatic brain injury, if you have, or a brain tumor, or something's happening bad in the brain, when the intracranial pressure goes up, and at the same time you see a slow heart rate, that probably means the brain is about to herniate and your patient's about to arrest. And that's a very, very strong sign of needing to do something emergently. So hypertension and bradycardia should always get your attention when they're combined. Um, and then obviously we've all seen the patient who's bradying down as they're about to arrest. So the heart rate gets slower and slower and slower and um, then they arrest. So we see it as a pre-arrest rhythm as well. Um, and then I kind of mentioned the um, hyperkalemia and then also increased vagal tone. So patients with chronic respiratory disease or chronic GI disease or the classes or ocular disease, those are the big things that we think of causing increased vagal tone and that will oftentimes lead to a sinus bradycardia. All right, with the respiratory rate and effort, patients that are apneic obviously aren't gonna be alive for very long if they're still alive. Tachypnea can be due to pain, excitement, being overheated, a primary respiratory problem. There are lots of things that can cause tachypnea. Um, and um, overt respiratory distress uh, could be due to either a primary respiratory problem like feline asthma or congestive heart failure. Those are usually the big ones. So a little bit more on respiratory distress. I just wanted to cover the big ones that we see, the big types. We have upper airway, lower airway, parenchymal disease, and pleural space disease. And I have a couple of videos to give you tips just by watching a breathing pattern. It might help you localize the source of the respiratory distress because that'll help you narrow down your differentials and know how you might need to intervene for these patients. Regardless, any animal with respiratory distress should always have supplemental oxygen. And the big thing is minimize um, stress. So sometimes we have to do things very stepwise, uh, very slowly with these patients. So all of you have seen this dog, I guarantee. Classic brachycephalic upper airway syndrome. You can hear it's noisy to the naked ear, right? 
So think about all the upper airway diseases, the classic ones we have. We have brachycephalic syndrome. We have laryngeal paralysis, right, of large older dogs. We have tracheal collapse. LARPARs, how many of you have ever seen a LARPAR, a laryngeal paralysis and respiratory stress? Did you need to see the dog or did you hear it around the corner? It's so noisy, right? The strider and the stirter. Brachycephalic dog, if you heard that around the corner, you'd have some idea there was a bulldog or something around the corner, right? And what do we associate with the tracheal collapse dog? What sound? Goose honk cough, right? So the thing with upper airway disease is it's always an obstruction. Upper airway disease is always an obstruction of some sort. And it's noisy to the naked ear. Depending on where the obstruction is will determine whether it's an inspiratory problem or an expiratory problem, but the majority are inspiratory, all right? And these patients will oftentimes have a really marked inspiratory effort because they're trying to move air past an obstruction and they can't get air in, so it's just really long, protracted, I'm trying to get air in, and then expiration is super passive. There's no effort to it, it's easy. So most of the time, upper airway are gonna be noisy to the naked ear um, and have a protracted inspiratory effort. Not a, usually not a big diagnostic challenge. Treating an upper airway dog, you have to relieve the obstruction. And sometimes, like in the LARPAR, the brachycephalic dog, or the tracheal collapse dog, relieving the obstruction is simply relieving their anxiety so they don't pull quite so hard because it's a dynamic obstruction where the LARPAR is sucking down the arytenol, arytenoids, to closing down the airway. The brachycephalic is probably sucking the soft palate down into his airway and obstructing that way. And the tracheal collapse, because it's pulling so hard, is collapsing the trachea. If you get, can get them to relax and not pull so hard, then they actually move larger volumes of air, and that's how we stabilize them most of the time. So anxiolytics are really important in these patients. So my favorite combinations are things like butorphanol with ACE for the LARPAR, and I tend to use butorphanol with either diazepam or midazolam for my toy breed, more foo-foo breed type things like tracheal collapse, all right? If they're really bad, you may have to be prepared to intubate. And that's usually an emergent induction, so I'm just gonna give them propofol rapidly until I can intubate and then I have control of the airway, all right? Now, if I have an upper airway obstruction, I always wanna be prepared when I go to intubate. I need to at least have something nearby because what if it's a big mass that I can't get them intubated? So I'm always prepared, I always have a lack pack in my crash cart, so if I need to do an emergency trach, I have it right there, all right? We hardly ever have to do it. It's a rare thing to actually have to do, but it, because most of the time we can get them intubated, even if there is a mask, we can kind of move things around and get in there. But if you can't, you need to be prepared to get an airway and it may be through tracheostomy. And then realize that the work of breathing actually generates a whole lot of heat. And so many patients with upper airway obstructions especially, because they're working so hard trying to pull air in, will get really high temperatures. And I've had many, many patients develop heat stroke because they had body temperatures over 110 secondary to their upper airway obstruction. All right? So then we're dealing with that. So we want uh, one of the things we're always doing with these upper airway obstruction dogs, because it is mostly a dog thing. We do see cats sometimes, but it's mostly a dog thing is we're gonna get them relaxed, give them an emergent sed sedative. If I need to, I'm gonna give propofol and emergently induce. Um, but then I'm gonna be getting a temperature pretty quick to document where I am. And if I need to, I have on my tables, I have a hose and I just start wetting out down usually the back end of the animal because usually my catheter's in the front. And just by getting them wet, they'll start to dissipate some of the heat um, and that will slow things down. And it actually makes them more comfortable as well because one of their drives to pant and move air is because they're overheated and they're trying to cool themselves as well. So if I can help them get cooled down, they have less drive to breathe hard, which makes everything better, all right? So active cooling until they're about 104, and then stop your active cooling. Otherwise, if you keep going, they'll bottom out, and I pretty much guarantee you they'll get to under 100, and it's hard, it seems, to get them back up. So usually actively cool to about 104, and then just kind of stop with the hosing off and see how they do. Lower airway disease is really classically, it's just the cat. So lower airway disease or disease of the bronchioles, that's the, when we see these animals in respiratory distress, it's, dogs don't get asthma. It's a cat disease. The correlate in dogs would be bronchitis, but it's pretty rare to see dogs in overt respiratory distress because of bronchitis. They may have a coughing fit, that they get into a little bit of trouble, but this overt respiratory distress, when we're looking at lower airway, we're really talking about cats with asthma. Asthma, what's classic about these cats is that then when you listen with the stethoscope, you'll have whistles and wheezes. Not all the time, but a majority of the time. The other thing is that with cats lower airway or with lower airway disease, because of the way um, 
the pressures change in the chest with inspiration and expiration, the most of the effort is actually on expiration. And so what, with most of the respiratory distress patterns, what we have is a, um, an inspiratory distress. With lower airway disease, with asthma and cats, they will also have an expiratory push. So at the end of expiration, instead of just being really passive, you'll see an expiratory grunt or an expiratory push, so it's more active. I'm asthmatic, so I actually know it's because you can't get the air out. And because I can't get the air out before I feel the need to get the next breath in, I start to have trouble getting air in, but the problem is I can't get the air out. So the difference is there's this active component to expiration, which is different from most of the other causes of respiratory distress. Parenchymal disease, um, and this dag is really sad. These owners euthanize pretty quickly. This is a little bit tough to watch. Um, parenchymal disease is basically um, anything in the lung itself. So it can be edema from heart failure, like cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or it could be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, like the puppy that bit the electric cord. It could be pneumonia. It could be bleeding into the lung from pulmonary contusions or anticoagulant rodenticide. It could be neoplasia. It could be a lot of things, but it's disease within the lung itself. And you can see this dog's definitely orthopnic. This is a dog who's in trouble. I think she would have arrested within the next hour, probably, if the owners had let her keep going. Um, she's really weak. She's about to give up. Um, so parenchymal disease, is, and she's breathing kind of short and shallow. It can be a little bit tougher to sort out, but it's definitely not upper airway, right? And she's not a cat, so it's not likely lower airway. So that helps a lot to narrow things down. It's most likely parenchymal. And then the only other thing it really could be um, is going to be pleural space disease as far as the big things to cause overt respiratory distress. So pleural space disease is when we have a problem in the pleural space outside the lung but within the chest cavity. And the big things that that can be are um, fluid. And fluid could be blood. It could be pus. It could be chyle. It could be a transient. It could be almost anything but fluid taking up space. It could be air, a pneumothorax. Or if you have organs displaced like a diaphragmatic hernia such that the lungs can't fully inflate, then that can cause the same pattern. And the pattern we see we refer to oftentimes as a restrictive breathing pattern. And, what I, and I have this angle of the camera on purpose. When we look at animals breathing and you think about looking at them uh, in respiratory stress, they're going to have an abdominal component, right? And when you look at them from the side, oftentimes what you see is the abdomen heaving in and out. And it makes it look like the chest is actually excursioning. So I always make a point in my respiratory distress patients to look at them either butt on, like this camera angle is, or head on. And I'm really what I'm looking at is I'm watching the chest excursion. How much is the chest actually moving? If that cat's breathing really hard, that chest should be going <sighs> And if the chest is only going <sighs> There's something restricting that breathing pattern. That chest should really be moving. And the best angle is going to be something like this. All right, so I'm going to play the video. And you can see, you'll see a little bit of the abdominal movement. But from the side, what you tend to see is a lot of abdominal movement. And it gives you the illusion the chest is moving. This way, it obscures some of the abdomen. So you can see the abdomen heaving in. But is that chest really moving outward? Not moving a lot, is it, for the amount of effort that that cat's breathing? So that's a very classic restrictive breathing pattern. And I'd be doing a, so what that means to me is, yes, oxygen minimize stress and set up for the thoracocentesis. Because what's going to stabilize that patient is getting the fluid off the chest or the air off the chest. All right. Common blood pressure abnormalities. Um, hypotension can be from shock, sepsis, heart failure, hypertension, lots of things that can cause it. We don't see it super often other than pain, excitement, stress. We do see that. So you always want to recheck high blood pressures to make sure it's not essentially a white coat effect. And then I just wanted to mention lactate and base deficit again. We'll see those in, we'll see lactate increase in the base deficit become more negative if patients are shocky or they have poor tissue uh, perfusion. And they're relatively inexpensive point of care tests that are very easy to run. So again, it's more objective information. And what's nice is we use those also in our resuscitation, hoping to normalize those values. So it can be very useful. And our goal is a lactate less than two and normalization of the base deficit for your um, machine. So I've got a list here of kind of my uh, suggested resuscitation endpoints. And it's basically normalization of heart rate, mucous membrane color improvement, blood pressure normal, et cetera. PCV greater than 25 in an acutely ill animal. If it's a chronically ill animal, you may be able to go lower depending on what the disease process is. And then I want a normal lactate and base deficit.
So in summary, the goal of triage is to prioritize which patient should be treated first. It should occur within one to two minutes of presentation. The triage is not the time for the full history. Uh, we want to focus on chief complaint and progression, and it's not the time for a full exam. We want to focus on mentation, respiratory, cardiovascular, and perfusion. We want to stop active bleeding and cover wounds to optimize outcome. And then once we take them to the back, we're going to start establishing our minimum database, consider administration of oxygen and fluid therapy, um, and realize that these patients can be very dynamic and therefore require frequent monitoring and reassessment. And those are my two latest rescues. All right. Thanks, guys.